If there is a historical parallel to the upcoming 2024 presidential race between the Democratic incumbent Joe Biden and his Republican opponent Donald Trump, we need to look no further than the historic election of 1968. Very much like our own present year, 1968 featured a pessimistic electorate with unpopular candidates, Richard Nixon on the Republican side and Lyndon B. Johnson's Vice President Hubert Humphrey on the top of the Democratic ticket. In this year's presidential election, Donald Trump's talking points resemble elements of Nixon as well as George Wallace's third party run in 68, both of which railed against an inflation crisis while pledging to bring back law and order. And while merely coincidental, both the 68 and 2024 elections feature a Democratic National Convention in Chicago, as well as an alternative presidential candidate named Robert F. Kennedy in the mix. But the biggest similarities between the two years is how both elections took place during an unpopular war, Vietnam in 68 and Gaza in 2024. Both years see a young generation marching in the streets and occupying college campuses to oppose a war supported by a democratic administration. Moreover, and quite interestingly, the presidential candidates in 1968 and 2024, both Republican and Democrat, can be said to share virtually identical foreign policies when it comes to one of the most divisive issues of their respective elections. In the same way that Nixon, Humphrey, and Wallace were all staunch cold warriors, Biden, Trump, and RFK Jr. hold essentially identical positions on Israel-Palestine, with all of them pledging continued and seemingly unconditional support for Israel, leaving voters with very little choice. And just as the unpopularity of the Vietnam War played a significant role in the Democrats' loss in 1968, President Biden has been warned by demonstrators that his unwavering support for Israel's ongoing genocidal campaign will lose him votes for the upcoming election. As Senator Bernie Sanders said recently in an interview with CNN, this may be Biden's Vietnam. But rather than changing course by implementing a ceasefire and withholding military aid to Israel, Biden as well as the Democratic Party leadership has condemned the demonstrators. Even if the protesters' pleas are quite popular with registered Democrats, with polls showing that they overwhelmingly support a ceasefire in Gaza, the party leaders have either ignored or even ridiculed these simple and rational demands from their own base. President Biden has instead denounced the demonstrators against the genocide in Gaza at college campuses, calling them anti-Semitic protests. And Biden's dismissive nature is eerily similar to how Hubert Humphrey in 68 also called the anti-Vietnam War protests as a mass childish tantrum. It is a problem now and a problem then. The Democratic Party has never gotten over its habit of scolding the very voters they need to win elections. The Democrats in our present year are making the same exact mistakes of the Democratic nominee Huber Humphrey during the presidential election of 1968. Losers in presidential elections are soon forgotten, and this might be even more of the case for Nixon's vanquished opponent. But we must not forget that Humphrey's loss to Nixon was a narrow one. With its close margins, even a modest defection among the party could have made the difference. Specifically, it can be argued that had Humphrey not alienated the younger generation and the left, the Democrats could have beaten Nixon. So how did Humphrey do this? How did he alienate his own voters? A look at the details offers unsettling similarities to Joe Biden's situation in the current election and serves, perhaps, as a cautionary tale. Humphrey was not just a hawk and a cold warrior who publicly defended President Johnson's foreign policy. He also went out of his way to denounce the very anti-war voters he needed to win the election. During the Democratic presidential primary, when Humphrey's opponent Robert F. Kennedy, before he was shot and killed, proposed a peace agreement by forming a coalition government with the communists in South Vietnam, Humphrey likened the proposal to putting an arsonist in a fire department. A watershed moment in the 1968 presidential election was the Democratic National Convention held in Chicago. When thousands of demonstrators gathered outside of the convention to protest against an unnecessary war that had killed tens of thousands of American soldiers and hundreds of thousands of Vietnamese civilians, Humphrey trivialized their movement, saying to the New York Times that it is very disheartening to see that a mob on the outside should feel that they should control that convention. And after those same protesters were rounded up, tear gassed, and had their skulls cracked with police batons, Humphrey, rather than condemning the excessive use of force, expressed praise for the man behind the law enforcement response. A few days after the convention was over, Humphrey said, We ought to quit pretending that Mayor Daley did something that was wrong. 
he tried to protect the lives. By all accounts, the violence that erupted during the 1968 DNC was provoked by the police and Mayor Daley. Religious leaders trying to calm tensions were attacked by the police. Security officials punched journalists such as Dan Rather and CBS reporter Mike Wallace in the face. Innocent bystanders who were not involved at all were also indiscriminately clubbed. One of the witnesses, Tom Wicker of the New York Times, wrote that the marchers did not threaten law and order in Chicago, not if ordinary police prudence, common sense, and legal procedure had been exercised. The truth is that these were our children in the streets and the Chicago police beat them up. And yet, as we have seen, Humphrey and the Democratic Party leadership sided with those doing the beating. They resorted to scolding the victims. Well after the convention, at a rally in Seattle, Humphrey's dismissive attitude was once again on display. When his campaign speech was interrupted by anti-war demonstrators chanting, Stop the bombing, stop the war, Humphrey lost his cool and shouted back, You've had equal time, now shut up. Rather than trying to win back the hearts and minds of the anti-war demonstrators who did not want a genocidal war in Vietnam to continue, the Democrats chose to further alienate those potential voters and in the process, sealed their own doom in the presidential election of 1968. Looking back on this chapter of the past, we find a striking parallel to the rhetoric of the Democratic Party today. The student-led anti-war protests against the US-backed Israeli genocide in Gaza constitute the largest such movement in the 56 years since 1968. And now as then, the Democratic Party leadership has defaulted to the same condescending attitude that very well may have cost them the election of 68. It is almost as if the Democrats want to lose in the upcoming 2024 presidential race. When anti-war students against the genocide in Gaza started occupying college campuses, Hillary Clinton went on MSNBC to mock the protesters, saying, They don't know very much at all about the history of the Middle East or frankly, about history in many areas of the world, including our own country. One senior Democratic congressman, Adam Smith, called the protesters fascist and totalitarian. Pennsylvania Senator John Fetterman slandered the campus encampments, saying, There's a very germ of anti-Semitism in all of these protests. And former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi even peddled conspiracy theories, saying that those calling for a ceasefire are echoing Mr. Putin's message. The similarities between the Democratic Party's harsh reaction from the anti-Vietnam War protests then and the Palestinian solidarity demonstrations now do not stop with the short-sighted and condescending rhetoric of politicians. On April 23, 1968, when students protesting the war in Vietnam occupied five campus buildings at Columbia University, their resistance was met with a heavy backlash from the police as well as from the political class. One week after the students began an occupation of five buildings at Columbia, including Hamilton Hall, which they renamed Malcolm X Liberation College, a thousand police officers removed the demonstrators with force arresting 700 students and injuring 140. The political elites from both parties then, just as today, denounced and ridiculed the students. Republican Richard Nixon called the protest a national tragedy and a national disgrace. And Supreme Court Judge Abe Fortas, a Democrat appointed by LBJ, also condemned the protesters. Justice Fortas said in an interview that the students' protests are totally inexcusable from the point of view of even primitive morality. And adding that, if the civil disobedience takes the form of disrupting traffic, preventing people from going to their offices, their buildings, perhaps even their homes, that is a violation of the law that should not be called civil disobedience. It is simply law-breaking on a large scale. The choice of the political class to condemn the student protests and to side with the violence exercised by law enforcement is almost exactly the same as the response from both politicians and the media today. Fast forward to April 30th, 2024. Anti-war students at Columbia once again occupy Hamilton Hall, this time naming it Hind Hall, in tribute to a six-year-old Palestinian girl who was murdered by the Israeli forces in Gaza. But unlike in 1968, when Columbia University waited a week to clear out the protests, university officials brought in the police to clear out Hamilton Hall within one day. A CNN journalist covering the scene gave emphasis to the inordinate nature of the police action, stating on air, I've covered lots of this sort of stuff around the world, and I've never seen this many police moving into one area. The speed at which the university reacted is explained, in part, 
by reporting by The Intercept, which noted that even before the encampments began, Columbia University hired private investigators to pursue pro-Palestine students. And once again, just as they did for the Columbia protests in 68, the Democrats have slammed the recent protests as well. President Biden's condemnation of the demonstrators was almost word for word that of Supreme Court Judge A. Fortas. Vandalism, trespassing, breaking windows, shutting down campuses, forcing the cancellation of classes and graduations. None of this is peaceful protest, the president said. The liberal media chose a somewhat more oblique way to denounce the students, stressing the idea that they were counterproductive to the assumed political leanings of the students. David Brooks of the New York Times wrote a column titled, Why the Protests Helped Trump. Jonathan Che of the New York Magazine also put out an op-ed called, Why the Right Loves the Anti-Israel Encampments. And Jonah Goldberg of the Los Angeles Times said, the nostalgic champions of the campus protests of the 60s would have Americans believe they were a historic success, stopping the Vietnam War. But what they actually helped achieve was Richard Nixon's election and seven more years of war. But let's correct the record here. For although Goldberg and others have suggested that the 68 protests ended up helping an even more hawkish Richard Nixon to win the presidency, this theory disregards the reality. In 1968, it was the young students and the left that actually gave the Democrats a fighting chance to win against Richard Nixon. During the Democratic presidential primaries, the left backed Eugene McCarthy and Robert F. Kennedy, both of whom explicitly wanted to end the war in Vietnam. But unlike today, the Democratic Party in 1968 did not require primaries for a presidential candidate to be nominated. The majority of the states at the time appropriated party delegates through state organizations and party conventions. A candidate could be nominated without participating in the primaries at all, so long as they got the endorsement from Democratic officials who were free to allocate delegates directly to whomever they liked. For example, in the Pennsylvania primary, Eugene McCarthy technically won, but because McCarthy failed to win the endorsement from party leaders, including the mayors of Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, and the president of the United Steelworkers of America, he didn't gain the vast majority of delegates from the state by the time of the Democratic Convention. Instead, they threw their weight behind the eventual Democratic nominee, Vice President Hubert Humphrey, who didn't even participate in the primaries directly at all, but who nonetheless secured the majority of the delegate count through old-school smoke-filled backroom deals. So, when the ballot box didn't work and their votes did not matter, the left exercised the only other Democratic right that was left to them. They took to the streets to protest. Although the Democrats belittled the demonstrators throughout the majority of the election season and sided with the police that beat them, late in the campaign on September 30th, Hubert Humphrey eventually conceded to some of the demands of the anti-war movement. The Democratic nominee said in a speech at Salt Lake City that he would stop the bombing of the North as an acceptable risk for peace. The pivot on Vietnam had almost an immediate effect. While polls before the speech had Richard Nixon leading by more than 15 points, soon after the speech at Salt Lake City, Humphrey's poll numbers jumped and he was neck and neck with his Republican opponent within a month. But unfortunately for Humphrey, the call for a bombing halt came too little for him to defeat Nixon. Some analysis suggests that because Humphrey's poll numbers continued to climb after the Salt Lake City speech, he might have narrowly won the 68 presidential race if the election was held just a week later. Humphrey could have become president had he called for a bombing halt much earlier in the campaign. In other words, if the Democratic Party leadership conceded to the demands of the anti-war movement from the start and even before the chaotic Democratic National Convention, they would have won. And now in 2024, almost the same exact mistakes are being made. While the presumptive nominee Joe Biden expresses platitudes about supporting a ceasefire in Gaza, he continues to send military aid to Israel. While Biden didn't have to face a formidable Democratic presidential candidate from the left, many primary voters cast uncommitted or blank ballots in an effort to call for a change of course. And, as we have seen, when students take to the streets or their own campuses, they get chastised by people like Hillary Clinton. Yet, what is so ironic is that the demands of the demonstrators are not at all radical. They are beliefs shared even by members of Biden's own inner circle who have warned the president that the genocidal war in Gaza may cost him the upcoming 2024 presidential race. 
We know this from a January 2024 letter directed to the White House and signed by more than a dozen senior campaign staffers who called for a ceasefire. In March, a group of top 100 Democratic donors signed another letter cautioning the president that the Gaza war is increasing the chances of a Trump victory. State Department officials, as well as an advisor to the Department of Education, have walked out of their jobs in protest. Even First Lady Jill Biden has reportedly expressed private concerns about Gaza to her husband. The fact of the matter is that the anti-war demonstrators today, just as in 1968, represent the true conscience of the country. The Palestinian Solidarity Movement bears the same level of moral clarity and courage as the anti-war demonstrators of 68 that came before them. The Democratic Party should recognize and even applaud the demands of the protesters rather than condemning them. One of the witnesses to the 1968 Democratic National Convention was the novelist and essayist Norman Mailer, who recounted his experience in the book Miami and the Siege of Chicago. While much of the American public lambasted the demonstrators in Chicago, Mailer gives a more idealized picture. Reflecting on the protesters, he watched battle with the police from the 19th floor of the Hilton Hotel. Mailer writes, They were a generation with an appetite for the heroic, and an air not without beauty. Young, devoted, and actually ready to die. They were not like their counterparts 10 years ago. Something had happened in America, some forging of steel. There were young men who were not going to Vietnam, so they would show every lover of the war in Vietnam that the reason they did not go was not for the lack of courage to fight. No, they would carry the fight over every street in Old Town and the loop where the opportunity presented itself. If they had been gassed and beaten, their leaders arrested on fake charges, they were going to demonstrate that they would not give up, that they were the stuff out of which the very best soldiers are made. The very same could be said of those demonstrators against the genocide in Gaza. The students, Arab Americans, young Jews, protesting a war for a people half a world away. They represent, as Norman Mailer wrote, a generation with an appetite for the heroic and are made with the stuff out of which the very best soldiers are made. They are fighting for a people they have never met, and perhaps never will. But they are willing to risk broken bones and the potential loss of a prosperous professional career out of the steadfast principle that all human life is sacred. Like the 68 demonstrators waving Viet Cong flags, the student encampment protests today bearing the Palestinian flag and wearing kafiyas are patriots marching not for the interests of a state power, but for the oppressed peoples of the world. And to quote Malcolm X, Truth is on the side of the oppressed. Apologies to the two times failed presidential candidate Hillary Clinton who thinks that my generation seems to know so little about history. But it is actually President Biden, the Democratic Party leadership, and the liberal media that have learned nothing. They have completely forgotten or ignored what happened in 1968. The Democratic Party think that they are owed the vote from the younger generation and believe they must be schooled in the dogma of its complacent reality, rather than changing course on an unpopular war in an effort to win them over. And just as in 1968, the Democratic Party in 2024 is perhaps sealing its own fate, paving the way for a crushing defeat against the Republican Party in November. Even if Biden and the Democrats are the lesser of evils, they should not and ought not feel themselves entitled to the votes from the younger generation when the whole world is watching the genocide in Gaza. My name is Rashid Saidi. I'm the Edward Said Professor of Modern Arab Studies at Columbia University. I've been teaching here for a total of 22 years. When I was a student back in the 60s, we were told we were led by a bunch of outside agitators, by politicians nobody remembers the name of today. We were the conscience of this nation when we opposed the Vietnam War and racism. Back in 1968 and 1969 and 1970, the Vietnam War stopped because the people opposed it. And the people who led that were students. And the students who led that were here at Columbia and at Berkeley and a few other campuses on this fair Turtle Island. Students have been on the right side of history at Columbia and at other universities ever since the 1960s. We today, woo, we today honor the students who in 1968 opposed a genocidal, illegal, shameful war. Columbia University honors them. They're on the Columbia website. You can check it out yourself. 1968 is commemorated. One day, what our students did here will be commemorated in the same way. Yeah! yeah.